started talking, we didn't have a plan. But I usually start to talk when we don't have a plan. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Why don't you start? My name is Gus. I'm the director of the film. Um, you all know Richard Lawrence. This is my brother Luke. He's the producer and the director of photography. And, uh, <laughs> well, we're going to have a Q&A, so, and by the way, we, we thought we'd also, uh, especially since there were some problems for after, before, we'd, we'd hang around a little bit after the Q&A, and, um, and maybe if people have books or something, we'll, we'll try and do some signing. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't know, are there, I don't know what the plan is, are there microphones? A yeah, there's microphone? there. And so should I, do you want me, Gus, do you want me to pick yeah, that? Yeah. Okay. Is that okay with you, Richard? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just I asked for more light, and I feel like... Yeah, I can. Can, you, is it, can these be turned up at all, or no? We can't really see. Oh, you're at the mic, okay. Why don't we start with you? But the mic isn't working. Oh, there you go. Hello? Okay. I was wondering about the end of the movie, uh, with Bill Pullman at the end, they're questioning the entire debate between atheists and theists. Um, what was the thought putting that there? Well, um... One part of truth, or...? Um, <laughs> well, we thought about that for a long time, actually. Richard, um, was, was, was uh, understandably concerned that maybe it wasn't the best thing to leave it on a questionable note. But I think we all kind of talked about it and decided that it's okay to leave it with an open question. Is it, is it okay to talk about these things and bang our heads against the wall, or is it, um, is it productive or not? I, I, think it's I, I really felt that this... Really an important. I, I, I argued pretty strongly to put that one in there. It was originally switched around, but but um, I, I think it's exactly that way. I mean, one of the purposes of doing the movie was not to preach, but to get a discussion going. And it's and I think we often feel that way. I don't know if you do. Sometimes you wonder if you're just banging your head against the wall, and it's the question we all ask. And so it seemed a good way to leave leave that question an open question and, and get people to think about it. I don't know how you felt. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, my question was not whether we should have ended like, like that, but whether um, we should have ended with w whether the uh, cameo parts by, the, by all the stars should have been interspersed with the film, uh, rather than put up at the end. Uh, like and then, that. I but, think uh, Gus and Luke tried that, but it didn't work. We had an early edit where we had the celebrity people throughout the whole film, but I think we kind of decided early on that it just took away from this kind of rock and roll tour film road movie that we were trying to do. And uh, it was just better to kind of look at the moment and, and let the story break out, just kind of capturing the moment that's happening right now and doing that as well. Okay, well, we'll probably get back to that rock and roll tour thing because I'm sure we're. Yeah? <laughs> Hi, Richard. It's Brian Partridge. I haven't seen you in 30 years since you were my uh, doctoral supervisor. And so I want to welcome you to San Diego and to thank you thank for you. everything you've uh, done in the name of science. Uh, we really applaud your courage and your. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't see any former students in my so we can go. Yes? Hi there. Uh, I'm Connie Wilson, resident of the SSA UCSD, and I was just wondering what we could do as a group that would best help to further the secular thoughts. You want to start? Encourage people to ask questions. Don't be, uh, don't tell people what to think. Try to encourage people to think. Teach children how to think, uh, but don't tell them what to think. Uh, we've had centuries, millennia of children being told what to think, and the time has come to instead uh, get people to ask questions, get children to ask questions, and, and to, to think for themselves. Let me add, the other thing I'd say, I think, is that, is that to portray yourself as a positive, excited movement. I mean, what you're really, at least, I think, what we're all excited about, I know Richard and I are, and I think it's talked about in the movie, is we're excited about the real world. We're not negative, we're not opposed to things. We want to get people excited about the world that actually exists, not the one they've invented in their minds. And so I think if people, if you can really work hard to show that you're not, that it's not that you're against things so much. You're maybe against nonsense, but you're, you're, you're pro thinking and pro being excited about reality. So I, I, I'd say do that to portray yourself. Then.
You want to know what you're talking about? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, some people think that religion is ineradicable, either because humans are genetically predisposed to religious belief, um, or that religious belief is a meme that is just too successful to eradicate. Um, do you think either of these are possible? And if not, what would you say to some of those? Well, it's clearly not ineradicable because it's been eradicated in, I would hope, most people here and certainly everybody on the platform. <laughs> um, it may be difficult to eradicate, but the answer to that is education. Uh, as I said before, to, to think for, for ourselves, but it's a, a, a gospel of despair to say it's, in, it's ineradicable and it's actually obviously false. Well, it, and Richard, didn't you, I mean, in England, I think for the first time, didn't the sense, I mean, the point is a number of people, at least in the first world, in the developed world, that, that are claiming they have religious affiliation has been monotonically going down. You, you could, if you wanted to, predict a date when it might be zero, but it's certainly been monotonically going down. I thought in England was the first time, this last census was the first time that a majority of people or something um, said that they had no religious affiliation or something like that? Well, yes, that's complicated because in Britain we have a census every 10 years and in 2011 uh, the census showed that something like 54% of people claimed to be Christian. Uh, that had come down from I think 73% in the 2001 census. However, the British branch of my foundation conducted a a poll in the very week of the census because we didn't believe that the census would be properly reported and we took those people who had ticked the Christian box in the official census and we took a sample of them a proper a proper sample and we asked them supplementary questions you tick the Christian box right what do you actually believe do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin do you believe that Jesus was resurrected? When all those subsequent questions show that these people who tick the Christian box, actually they're not Christian at all. So we ask them, why did you tick the Christian box? And the most popular answer to that was, oh, well, I like to think of myself as a good person. <laughs> that, that's what we're up against. That's what we're up against. But we also ask the question, given that you'd like to think of yourself as a good person, when you have a moral dilemma to face, do you turn to your religion in order to solve that moral dilemma? And once again, no. Only I think 10% said they turned to their religion. The majority of people did what we all do, which is turn to friends, turn to that sort of sense of, 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 of morality, which we all have anyway. So, so that suggests that although the official census said that I think it was 54% of the British people are Christian. The real figure is far, far lower than that. And my bet is that the same would be true in America as well if people answered poll questions honestly. Yeah, they tend to, I think I said in the film, they tend to pick and choose what they like, most people, and, and, um, and don't take the whole doctrine. But I think at the same time we have to recognize that not only are we against the no working against the notion, it's sociological, I think as much as biological, that, that being an atheist makes you a bad person, or not, or at least not being religious makes you a bad person. That puts a lot of pressure on people to at least make the statement that they're religious. But also, I think we have to say that religion has, organized religions have provided a variety of things that are useful, that have been useful, not only to maintain their own power, but sociologically, you know, sense of community, all these other things. And the, the key, and so people say, why do you want to get rid of religion? It does that. And the, to me, the important point is that, well, those are useful things, but we don't need religion to do that. We could, I, I always think we'd have a rock concert every Sunday instead of a, uh, instead of a, a, a church service. It's still the same sense of community, fun, and more drugs. But uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to have, that joke made me forget what I was going to say next. Time. I'll remember, but anyway, okay. Yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering, in your opinion, could you give me a definition of agnostic versus atheist? These are words which are used in different ways by different people. Uh, 
I think it was T.H. Huxley, I know it was T.H. Huxley, coined the word agnostic, and he meant it in a rather positive way. It was an open-minded scientific approach, uh, curious, waiting for evidence, that kind of thing. And I think we're all of us agnostic in that sort of sense. Uh, other people use it to mean you're not absolutely sure. Uh, and again, we're all agnostic in that sense. We're all agnostic about whether there are fairies and leprechauns and things like that. Uh, other people use the word agnostic to mean you think that because you can't be sure, it's exactly 50-50. It's like tossing a coin. There might be a god, there might not be a god. Uh, and that, I don't think, is a very fruitful use of the word agnostic, because that actually is actively misleading. You can say, I can't be sure one way or the other, but I still don't think that it's exactly 50-50. I think there's a probability waiting uh, one way or the other. I, uh, in the God Delusion, introduced, I think it was a seven-point scale between people who are totally sure there is a god on the one end, they, they were the ones, I think, and the sevens were people who are totally sure that, that there isn't. I think I called myself a 6.9, uh, because you can't be absolutely sure of any, of any negative. Uh, but very few people, I think, are exactly 50-50. Uh, if you're a anything like a six, that means that you, you can't be absolutely sure that there's no God, but you think it's no more likely than that there's a tooth fairy, and you live your life on the assumption that you better get on with your life and not mess around with, with superfluous possibilities like, uh, like supernatural beings. So I think a de facto atheist would be somebody who lives their life as though uh, there is no supernatural being, and that's what I certainly am. And I think, uh, to add to that, I, I mean, in science, the key point is that we, it, it's always, we, we don't, there's no certainty about anything. Yeah. There's certainly a falsehood. Things you can demonstrate and work against experiment are just wrong. But otherwise, it's a, it's a scale. It's something very likely or very unlikely, and we quantify that, especially in physics. We can quantify our uncertainty. And so, in that sense, I agree with Richard that no, there's no one, there's no scientist who can say, as a scientist, that it's 100 percent certain that there's no God, because it's not. A, it's in some sense, it's not a false hypothesis. But you could say it's highly unlikely. And Kurt Russell gave the example of a a teapot orbiting Jupiter, I think, but th that you can't, I can't prove there's not a nice kind of teapot orbiting Jupiter, but it's, there's no reason to suspect it's there, it's highly unlikely it's there, and therefore I can act, I can assume, unless proven otherwise, it isn't there. And I think the other thing that's very important is that when you say it's living your life, assume as if there is no God. Most people do that. In, 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 their, in their everyday activities, and all scientists do it, regardless of their religious affiliation. Uh, when they, uh, that famous biologist said, when I go in the laboratory, I forget who it is, uh, uh, J.F. Haldane, I think, is that, said, when I, when I go in the laboratory, I'm an atheist, I'm not assuming that someone's while twiddling the knobs to make the experiment be what I want it to be. So if I'm an atheist in the lab, why shouldn't I be outside the lab? Um, could I just plug an excellent uh, YouTube video on this? Jacqueline Glenn did a lovely YouTube on, on this that matter of atheist and agnostic. I recommend it. Over here. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. You're Hello, welcome. reasonist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did not turn this card in because I think it is already a prize worth the great pearl to be in the same building with uh, Professor Dawkins and uh, Professor Krauss and Congress here. Um, being a selfish objectivist like I am, I'm going to ask two questions if you don't mind. First off, I'd like to know what new uh, discoveries in the magisterium of evolutionary biology can you share with us? And number two, I'd like your opinions about the somewhat metaphysical seeming uh, musings and ideas of Sam Harris. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me about physics, darn it. Okay. Uh, you start. I think that uh, biology is an ex in an ex evolutionary biology is in a very exciting phase at the moment. Uh, there we go. I think evolutionary biology is in a very exciting phase because really of molecular genetics. This is something which Darwin couldn't possibly have dreamed of. The idea that in every living creature, in every cell of every living creature, 
there is a digital instruction book written in the, in the same digital code in every creature, in every cell, which means that whereas Darwin could only use comparative anatomy and comparative physiology as a way of inferring relationships between living creatures, we now have a massive digital dictionary, di a digital encyclopedia inside every living cell, which means that you can uh, compare any creature with any other creature and in principle work out with great certainty, eventually this will be done, there's still a lot of problems to be ironed out, work out exactly the, the tree of life, the, 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 the tree of cousinship by which individuals are related to each other. This is a very, very fast moving field and I think it's a, a very exciting field for a young person to get into today. I would add, I think that physics is also a very exciting field <laughs> for a young person to get into, uh, not least because of the, uh, the new results which are, which are coming out. Let me, um, let, yeah, I'll, I'll answer a little bit, obviously, and then maybe we'll mention Sam, I don't know, but um, uh, it is a very exciting time. I didn't, my mother wanted me to become a doctor when I was young, and um, she made the mistake of telling me doctors were scientists, so I got interested in science. And, anyway, um, and then I, uh, but when I, I, I dropped biology in high school because when I was doing biology, it was memorizing parts of a frog, memorizing parts of a leaf, memorizing this or that, and I didn't like to memorize them. And it would be a, it's a very different world now, and I, I think when, you know, if I have to say, there's no doubt in my mind that, that the field that I think is evolving most quickly that's not a pun, is, is, is biology in general. And, and, uh, and evolution is a central part of biology. So it's an incredibly exciting time. Happily, it is an exciting time in physics right now, in the last few weeks in particular, and I'm very excited about it. Um, and, and, and what I thought when you talked, when you got to metaphysical, you were gonna say, what I like is the fact that we've turned in the last few weeks a lot of metaphysics, or people would, would claim what was some of what my book might have been, what might have been metaphysics. It's now science, because we can see it. And so it's really, turn, anytime you can turn metaphysics into science, it's a good thing. Um, and speaking of metaphysics, uh, uh, you did ask the question. Sam, Sam is a friend of both of ours and, and is a wonderful writer and speaker. Uh, I think in certain areas I happen to disagree with him, and, and particularly related to Buddhism and, and, and that kind of aspect. I, I think um, um, I don't see much difference between that and, and the other religions. Uh, but that's just, uh, you know, that's a personal thing. Do you want to say anything else? Or? Well, I, I think that, that Sam is interested in meditation as a physiological technique. I, I don't think he believes in any of the religious stuff about Buddhism at well, all. We've had a few discussions. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, but he is primarily interested in from, from, a, from the, the, the neurophysiological uses of meditation. Yes? Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, I think one of the things that is best about science is that it's constantly uh, providing new information and new challenges to face and asking new questions. And in light of you know, the tour that you guys do and your history with uh, engaging with you know, people who don't have that same worldview, do you ever see new arguments? Because I feel like this, I see the same arguments. You know, when I first started to get involved in the secular community, it took like 15 minutes to see every argument we have. And I don't know if you've ever, if you know, in your travels, have seen any new or interesting arguments that you had to challenge. No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> And it is frustrating, I know we both have this experience, it's frustrating. Not only the argument's not new, but even when you counter them, it's like they just repeat it to you again and again in the same stage, the same time, the same, the same argument. And I tend to think that there's some of, that's the other thing, and now I remember what I was going to say about religion. You know, my wife and I were just talking earlier about when you're a kid, you like to have things, you like to read the same book over and over again. It, 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 it gives you a sense of security, and, it, and at some point, you're supposed to grow out of that. But, but I think it, it, there's no doubt that that familiarity breeds security. And, and I think it's a, it's a sign of how insecure religious people are truly in their beliefs is that they have to go to church every Sunday and repeat them. I mean, we don't do quantum mechanics every Sunday and say, let's repeat it. 
Because now we'll keep believing, because we don't repeat it every Sunday, we might stop believing it. So I think that repetition is really, anyway. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Carlson, Mr. Dawkins. <clears throat> Sorry, but um, people have called you guys militant atheists, and even Colbert accused you of attacking his God. And I want to know <laughs> if you consider yourself as militant atheists or as educators or something else. Well, Richard is not militant. I can tell you that. Okay, <laughs> Richard has, his, you know, many people think Richard is striving in militant law. And, and, and I can say, not only is he not, and not only am I not, but what amazed me is that I could sympathize with that much more than I used to when we first met. After my last book came out, where I didn't, I just asked the question, could we make the universe without God? How much do we know? Is it possible? And just asking the question immediately put me in the same camp. I became a militant, strident atheist just for asking questions. And so I think that word is used for some reason, asking a question when it comes to God makes you militant. And, it, and it's, it's offensive, it's wrong, and it's not true. And, and Richard gets a bad rap, uh, in my opinion. It's, it is true that when the Archbishop of Canterbury is introduced, he's never introduced as militant, strident Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> There's a kind of asymmetry in the use of these words. Like. Yeah, in fact, if you're a fervent believer, you're fervent, right? Yeah. You know, you're strong, you're, you're you know, it's, it reminds me of when I was, uh, yeah, I grew up in Canada, and it talked about the difference between football and baseball, the words, you know, tackle versus go home, you know, and, and, uh, and, and it's that way, with every adjective that's used to, to apply to believers is a positive one, and every adjective that's used to apply to even not just non-believers, but people who question is a negative one, and, and it's something we have to try and overcome. But I think, it, <clears throat> I think it is true that our whole civilization has got it so used to religion getting a free ride that you just don't criticize it. That when you offer even a mild criticism of, of religion, people genuinely hear it as militant and strident because they're so unaccustomed to it. We're quite accustomed to political argument being quite strong and we don't use words like militant and, and strident. But it's because we've all got so used to the idea that you just don't criticize religion. It's sort of impolite. If you criticize or even question, as Lawrence says, even question somebody's religion, it's as though you said they've got an ugly face or something of that sort. Identify with it personally. So it sounds worse than it actually is. Uh, I think that, that the key point here, and I worry about it in this country, is not just religion. Various other things are becoming more, more and more, or less and less subject to questioning. And I think what you said at the very beginning is, if, if I could give a message, it's not a message about God or science, it's a message to just question and don't be intimidated from questioning. And that has to do with everything from religion to the tea party. Thank you. you want to talk? Loud.